Paleo to Pioneer presents Small Batch Science, Episode 12. Welcome back to Small Batch Science. I'm your host, Dr. Bison, also known as Andy Hemmings. Um, this is a special edition We're talking about the animals alive on the North American landscape at the very end of the Pleistocene, and we'll really focus on the extinct ones, all those scary, now long gone monsters. Aren't you glad I didn't try and speak through that ridiculous mask? Some people have no shame whatsoever. So, people in the New World have been interested in the what we now recognize as Pleistocene fauna, especially the big um, herbivores, mammoth and mastodon in particular, because it's easy to find large bones of them, and they were found as early as the late 1600s in the, in the northeastern part of America. The very idea of extinction didn't develop for a couple of hundred years into the search of these things. The understanding of their own life history, biology, all that really took some time. And what I'm going to focus on are those things that have been found at archaeological sites across Canada, Mexico, and America, um, particularly because we now realize that what, what was less than a thousand years of overlap when I was in school long, long ago, which wasn't actually the place to see, has grown from being a little bit of overlap to fairly considerable overlap, that it's in the order of five, six thousand years, and, and maybe more now, we're, we're not sure. And, you know, the, the, the basement on that keeps growing. So there's two big themes that I want to mention that sort of overarch all this. A lot of this discussion of the association or presence, and I am really arguing just simply the presence of all these things at a number of archaeological sites, and then the level of association, whether people just saw them, or actually hunted them, or made things from their bones, or their skin, or, or, or whatever, are, are sort of different issues, and, and I'm going to probably end up just breaking down and doing a series of videos on each individual animal or group of animals, um, depending on how much data there is for any one of them, um, because we could bog down on the mammoth and mastodon, or the bison, or you know, any number of other interesting animals for, for hours. So I'll try not to do that. I hope I can limit my derailing of myself to only five or six asides in a few minutes here. The, and, and I'll just do this at a real grand scale and, and move on because, uh, for instance, well, I, I don't want to get into that just yet, but the real issue that really drives me bonkers about all this is that there are a number of papers over the last 15, 20 years where people discuss genera, the presence or absence of genera of animals at archaeological sites, and then they talk about extinction at the level of genera. Have you ever bought a genera at the grocery store? Have you ever hunted a genera? Have you ever seen a genera in the wild? Of course not. It's absurd. It's an idea. It's a, it's a way we organize life. We are homo sapiens. Genus homo and the species is sapiens. Or Homo sapiens sapiens, the thinking, thinking, the thinking humans now. It's a useful intellectual device. It is not reflected in biological reality. Individuals of species live, reproduce, and die. End of story. If somebody's trying to sell you on the notion of genera, they are being disingenuous at best. And if you find me in person, I will be more than happy to expound on that because it's, it's a problem. It's a real problem and it really models what we think we see for the dynamic of extinction at the end of the Pleistocene. Um, the best example of that is the fact that mountain lions, Felis concolor, are extinct in North America. And really the correct word for that at the end of the Pleistocene when they disappear is extirpated. They survive in South America. Sometime after 10,000 years ago, they return. There's a wonderful paper um, about the genetics of, of the various groups of, of surviving mountain lions and that all of North America modern mountain lions are most similarly related to the northernmost South American group. That they, that is the founding or colonizing population that came back. And if you deal with genera, Felis never went extinct, so there's no story. And in fact, one of the most interesting and compelling stories of, of all the extinction 
and, and um, faunal rearrangement at the end of the Pleistocene is in fact in the cats and in the genus Vila. But again, individuals exist and reproduce and die and leave their remains behind. And that's really what we should be talking about because when you look at the level of species, um, right now my master list of, of all taxa, that includes fish, snakes, birds, and all the other um, vertebrates through up to mammals, uh, is 82 species. Far greater than the things you'll see in the, in the 36, 38 genera. And again, it, by dealing with species, it really opens up the story and gives you a, an immensely larger data set to work with and, and a lot more interesting and compelling stories. And like I said, I won't do more of those right now. I'll break those down in a, in a series of videos on these animals. But um, there's not a huge amount of data, on, or I'm sorry, a huge amount of um, specimens of a lot of the lower vertebrate, and I don't have good examples. The, the reason I went with all of my ridiculous plastic animals, which took a lifetime to collect, I promise, um, is that I don't want to think about, I don't want you thinking about bones today or, or the products that, that humans, you know, make making tools too much or hunting and stuff like that. Really just trying to talk about the environment at large and the animals that are on that environment. So if we come over by our pumpkin, a nice cucurbit, which we know that they were eating, um, mastodons were eating 14,000 years ago at Page Ladson and 34,000 years ago at Latva Simpson, which is a site that we'll come to at the end today. Um, there's a number of birds. There's a couple of kinds of ducks that are present at archaeological sites. There's, there's more on the landscape, but I'm, I'm just trying to focus, like I say, on things that are in that last 15,000 to 13,000, 10,000 years ago where they occurred where people were. In, in broadest terms, I could say this is what I'm talking about is the menu that's available at Clovis and for the first pre-Clovis people. What they ordered, we'll worry about later, but today we're talking about the, the menu writ large. So there are quite a number of birds, probably 50 or 60 different kinds, only a couple go extinct. One is actually a teal that uh, is present down at Vero. There's a couple of different kinds of eagles that go extinct, which is pretty fun. Um, even a snake or two. And you know how hard it is to find a little bitty snake like that? Um, there's manatees are present here in Florida and probably across the Gulf Coastal Southeast, um, but none at Paleo Indian sites. I just um, wanted to put them out because I put out a fragment of a, of a of actual rib uh, because they're such a common fossil and there's such a common piece of bone that are, is found. Um, you, you would think they're almost ubiquitous. They got to be on. They've got to have been seen by the earliest humans, and, and we just don't know. Um, almost assuredly, they were. It would be preposterously easy to hunt, but we don't really have any good evidence for them. Um, sticking with aquatic stuff for just a moment, I've said this, I don't know if I've said it in any of the videos before, I know I've said it in speeches, but it's one of my favorite jokes, and to realize that some poor sucker at the end of the Pleistocene was the first human being to figure out they could not run an alligator. There's a story there. I don't know that we'll ever get it, but there's there's a story that we've lost. F Florida man, <laughs> the first Florida man story. Um, some of the other animals that are pretty interesting that do go extinct and um, have different relatives uh, in South America, some of which are genetically closely related but are, are very different animals. This is this um, scoot from the shell of a um, glyptodont. This is my, my little toy is actually a South American glyptodont. Uh, the Florida glyptodont doesn't have all the spikes on the tail. It's a fairly straight, smooth tail at the end of it. But a real neat animal that occurs at four or five sites across archaeological sites across North America. Many more um, paleontological sites, but again, stressing the, the potential to be seen or interacted with by early humans. Um, the armadillos are a real interesting story. This is a, a toy of a modern one. These are some real um, scoots from the shell of Holmzina, the um, now extinct giant armadillo that was probably two-thirds the size of the table we're sitting at, maybe three, 350, 400, 450 pounds. Um, there's also another one, the beautiful armadillo, that was about two, two and a half times the modern one that's digging up your yard now, um, that also goes extinct at the end of the Pleistocene. 
There's a couple of interesting turtles, um, the, uh, a subspecies of the uh, uh, Carolina terrapin goes extinct, and the giant um, uh, land tortoise that used to be called Geochiloni, and it's a shame it went away, but now it's called uh, Hesperoditis? I don't know, it's terrible, it makes me weep. Just a couple of uh, pieces of turtle. There are pretty good at pieces of evidence of um, probably hunting or, or at least carved pieces of bone. I, I don't like the shell at Little Salt Spring. I don't. When it was reassembled, the pieces that were said to be burned, one piece on the outside joins with a piece on the inside that's said to be burned. It, 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 it's very weak evidence down there, and the stake is 1,500 years younger than the turtle itself. So I don't think that turtle was almost 2,000 years old when somebody poked it. So anyway. There are some very good turtle stories, and we'll, we'll probably do turtles just by themselves. There's a lot of fun stuff there. Um, moving right along, uh, one interesting thing, I'll skip to a bit larger mammal for a minute, just in particular because I needed to show this picture of an antler uh, flaking tool. It's certainly cut at the tine end, and I have another picture somewhere that I didn't find right away, but there may be some battering here. So. Um, if anyone had tried to make one of these and was curious if it worked as a, a billet or a hammer for indirect percussion, here's a better view than, than my shoddily made one that I showed previously. But um, the reason to bring deer up is that they're actually a fairly uncommon, if not rare, animal on the Pleistocene landscape. They're just flat out out-competed by everyone else that, that fills their niche, particularly the mastodons. The, the, browser niche has a lot of a lot of members that are that are there at the end of the Pleistocene. I'm gonna end up being an hour here if I don't get going. So there's two different kinds of pigs. I have a cast of one that looks more like um, Myohylus. The, the modern Seuss scruff, I just did that to show that there's a couple different kinds. Um, Myohylus nastius should tell you all you need to know about how cuddly that animal is. And the other one is um, Platygonus compressus, which is the Longhead or, or flathead, um, flathead um, peccary. Um, both of those are actually pretty good evidence that people were interacting with them on occasion. Um, there's two kinds of capybaras, and there are some capybaras that survive in South America, and some are even wild. Um, we live a couple of miles from where the uh, animal kingdom at, at Disneyland did the quarantine for all the animals they brought to Florida. And some of the capybaras got out and live in the Santa Fe River about two miles away. And we actually saw one on a bike ride one time. There's uh, the taper, which taper viroensis is found across North America. Um, there are surviving examples in South America that are that are fairly similar, just, you know, um, cousins, if you will. They're not the same genus even, but um, not, not terribly distantly related. So they're an okay approximation if you wanted to see what a taper looked like in Florida at the end of the Pleistocene. There was the giant beaver here. Um, Castoroides, I think there's now two species of Castoroides, the one here in Florida. Oh, I think I said the wrong name. That may be Didophilus. Anyway, there's two kinds. They, they're considered now to be two kinds of Castoroides, the giant beaver. Um, the regular size modern beaver was also present in some places, but I don't know that we have a, a place to see an archaeological site that, it, that was present here in Florida. Um, one of the other interesting classes of animals, um, are the camelids, and there was camelops, hesterinus, a, a, a camel, really, or a, a more strictly camelid, um, that was not present in Florida, but we had two here related to the llamas, and um, a surviving one. You know how hard it is to find a llama figure um, in, in America? Um, a paleo llama, and oh my goodness, I'm so ashamed. Um, the stout-legged and the stilt-legged, and I cannot believe, I cannot remember it. It'll come to me, I'll come back to it. Um, these are pieces of uh, some bones we found in the Santa Fe and we were trying to um, use for an early uh, DNA extraction five or six years ago. Um, part of a um, shoulder blade of a, of a taper or paleolama. Hemiakinia is the other one. Um, these are uh, part of a, a long bone, just little fragments. I just, I, I, I don't have a lot of fossils and artifacts and stuff, so. I use casts, and, and I just had a few of the real ones here. Um, horses are a real interesting story, and, and I'll definitely do a video on the Pleistocene horses themselves. They're much smaller than what you think of for you know domestic horses today. It's not don't think quarter horses. Think uh, Przewalski's horse in, in Siberia, or uh, something sort of um, 
uh, grayish buckskin color, maybe more um, the size of a zebra, a zebra without its stripes. Um, morphologically, for years, 150 years, they've been categorized as, as, as three different species, maybe more. Um, it's not clear now, based on genetics, if there's any more than just one with a hum humongous amount of range in their size and, and, and even shape and, and the way they look, variability. But uh, I think that one's unresolved, or at least it's still contentious. So we'll see if the morphological differences of species hold up. But I think genetically they've, they've pretty much been all squished together. Uh, a couple of other interesting things. We'll go to the carnivores, and then I'll finish with the two big most common at archaeological site animals, the, the proboscideans and the, and the um, bison. There's three kinds of sloths across North America. The little bitty one is Megalonyx, named, uh, initially tried to, uh, Thomas Jefferson tried to name it and thought because of the giant terrible claw they were um, uh, carnivores. And he was very quickly and um, politely um, corrected and then it was named in honor of him Megalonyx Jeffersoni. Um, in his defense, he did write the paper while he was president, or at least campaigning for, for the presidency. Um, and I say they're tiny, barely, barely enormous, merely gigantic, um, probably 12 feet tall, sitting on their haunches, browsing, grabbing branches and leaves. The, the middle-sized one is a paramylodon that's probably about 14 feet tall. Um, and again, another giant ground sloth, not like the arboreal hanging ones that survive around in South America. And the biggest one, it's present at a couple of archaeological sites. Um, I'm sorry, it's present at Vero is the only archaeological site, and it may be earlier. We don't know. It's also been found in the upper Oscilla. The youngest dated piece right now is 39,000 radiocarbon years. So uh, it's, it's, it's a maybe, but it's, it's one of the things that we're working on. We're going to try and date um, the known specimens from archaeological sites or near archaeological sites in the Oscilla and see if we can actually put it on the arematherium on the landscape at the time that people are here. Um, it would have actually been the largest land mammal in the Pleistocene, in the end of the Pleistocene here in North America. Um, probably 22 feet uh, nose to tail and probably about eight, uh, as big as 18 feet when it's sitting on its haunches pushing trees over and knocking things down. And again, uh, one thing I haven't brought up yet I'll do with the elephants is the discussion about terraforming, which is a beautiful word to just talk about how these really big animals uh, tear things up. And maintain habitat. They keep things open, they keep it fairly treeless, and grasslands. And that benefits a lot of the other smaller animals, like the llamas, the horse, or I should say the camelids, the horses, um, um, even mammoth. But the mammoths are capable of opening it up on their own. Um, deer probably aren't, it's probably not helping deer, and that's again one of the reasons they're sort of a more uncommon animal. Um, Several critters, different skunks. There's a couple skunks that actually do go extinct. There's raccoons, there's possums, um, um, armadillos. I mean, the, the things you, that are here now were largely here in the Pleistocene. And then there's a lot of other things like the skunks that go extinct. Um, some foxes, there's a fox that goes extinct. The uh, canids are a real interesting animal. I realize I skipped somebody. Um, they're not here in Florida, but there are two kinds of muskox. Um, Boothotherium bombifrons, which I think is an awesome name and should have been one of the dwarves in um, The Hobbit, and Eucerotherium, and they're both a um, uh, shrub, and I forget what the common name for the other one is, but um, they are both present at uh, uh, Boothotherium at two sites and Eucerotherium at five sites. So there's a sporting chance that not only do people see them, but were actually in, in, you know, interacted with them at some level. The canids, all the dogs are real interesting sweet animals. There's the dire wolf, there's a couple different kinds of uh, smaller wolves, the red wolf, probably timber wolf. Uh, genetically that probably is, we're probably seeing those synonymized a little bit at this point, but I confess I haven't looked for a year or so. Uh, you can probably hear in the background that I haven't done my chores and fed the pigs yet, so we'll wrap this up pretty quick. Um, one thing that is really cool and really worth looking at more closely is the fact that it appears pretty convincing, I think fairly compelling evidence at this point, that the people who first come in the Pleistocene didn't come alone, that there were dogs with them. And sorting out Canis familiaris, Canis domesticus, if that's even still a thing, it was an older name that has been um, ascribed to, to some remains at a few archaeological sites, um, 
there's a really big story there. I, I have a wonderful research project on that that I need to get funded, but um, if you're interested, shoot me a note. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But until I'm ready, um, I, I'm not putting that out there too much. The cats are a really interesting story as well. There's um, in Florida, we actually had jaguars. So seeing jaguars slowly but surely recolonizing Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, along the border areas um, is, is pretty exciting. And I've heard a rumor of a jaguar in Florida, but I don't know if that's, I don't even know if it's anything more than a rumor at this point. I don't believe it's verified or anything, but um, there was Pantera Oka, Onca here. The jaguar was here. Um, we have lynx, which is still here, and they were um, present at a number of archaeological sites. Um, and then two others, the American lion, which was Felis Aatrox, now it's Pantera Leo Aatrox, I believe, and um, uh, Smilodont Fatalis, the deadly or fatal smile, which is a beautiful way of, of putting the, that. How we behave as human beings is a real interesting thing that would have gotten us today, would have gotten us um, a, a very short stay in the Pleistocene if we acted the way we do today. The American lion and the saber, that saber cat, individual large males could run up as much as 625 pounds, basically the same size or the same weight as a Bengal tiger, except these are likely animals that hunted in packs rather than being solitary. Uh, dire wolves running, you know, 150 to 225, maybe 250 for a real big one. Um, I may be a little high on that, but it, you get the idea that it's a very large dog and that they hunt in packs and you probably really want to uh, watch your six. You want to pay attention to what's going on around you because there are a lot of other carnivores on the landscape that you don't have to think about anymore. Um, one of the others is about maybe two-thirds the size of this guy, the grizzly bear. Um, grizzly bear is not present at any archaeological sites in the lower 48. Obviously, maybe there's something in the Pleistocene in Alaska, but I, I wouldn't, I'd be very reluctant to say that. I just show it um, just to bring up that uh, Tremarctus was here, that sometimes called the spectacled bear, Florida cave bear, or uh, short-faced bear. There was also black bears and uh, obviously the surviving you know, um, brown bears and grizzly bears were elsewhere in, in the country, but not necessarily here in Florida. Um, moving to our, our final contestants of the day, the bison antiguus, bison occidentalis, the modern bison bison, yes, bison bison, and um, even bison latifrons, the long straight-haired one, um, may have survived as late as 15,000 years or so. <laughs> we have a deaf dog trying to trip our um, camera lady right now and they're having technical difficulties. <laughs> um, the uh, bison antiguus, sort of generic name for all the way around um, bison, um, are present at 55, 60 archaeological sites that are Clovis or older, not even counting the Folsom thing and Agate Basin and all the stuff out on the plains where the numbers skyrocket. People saw bison antiguas for an awful long time, interacted with them, and, and by the end of Clovis times are already making and using all kinds of bones, the hides, almost assuredly um, the vast majority of the animals is being utilized by the, by that end of Clovis. Um, they're a really interesting thing to talk about. I talked about, I've, I've mentioned extinction and extirpation. And extirpation just means locally extinct, but they survive over there or somewhere else. Um, bison undergo what's called um, phyletic extinction. So basically the animal persists, but they've gotten smaller. A, a large bison antiguous bull would have been about eight feet tall, maybe as much as 4,000 pounds. The modern ones are maybe six feet, six, you know, every now and then maybe a six and a half footer. Um, and it's un, I think it's unusual to push 3,000 pounds. They, they can, but you could feed it one at a lot and get it real fat and make it big, but um, naturally occurring. They're, they're not, um, they're about three quarter size of, of the Pleistocene ones. So what's happened though is, and yes, I wore the ridiculous hat to make one point at the end of this. Um, uh, I don't have a horn corn for the bison, the bison antiguous horns are like here, bison, and bison, 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 they rotate down. The reason I say bison, bison, bison is that today there's the plains bison, it gets bison three times, and there's bison, bison, Nathabascus, which is a, a subspecies um, that's called the woodland bison. Um, there are on the plains a number of bison jumps, like as illustrated with my mini guys. Um, 
not that I don't know that we know of any east of the Mississippi. Actually, the furthest east one's probably in Texas. Um, here, there is some other evidence of predation. There's a, a scan, a cat scan of the Wasissa bison in the in the fragment of the point that was embedded in its skull. Um, apparently, that's come back onto the literature as a contentious thing, a bone of contention, if you will. Um, uh, Jim Dunbar and I and a couple others um, have an article coming out in the Florida Anthropologist any day now, I guess for the December issue, um, where we um, went back to the site, the actual site, because we knew where it was, and the others didn't, uh, and found some new data and have quite a bit to say about why we think it's a legitimate archaeological occurrence of, of a bison. The proboscideans are the most common uh, for Cuvier Ionius, the gomphothere, um, is only present at a couple archaeological sites, but El Fin de Mundo in Sonora, Mexico is a, is a heck of a site and, and is a real linchpin in showing that that animal was on the Pleistocene landscape and in fact Clovis hunters killed one. Um, at least one, I'd have to go look to make sure they have an eye. Um, mammoth and Mastodon are present at at least from some identifiable remains, not necessarily a full skeleton or anything, but um, at 175 sites, that's probably climbed down since I last thought about it, probably put it at about 180, and um, there's very good evidence, as we've seen in the bone tools and some discussions of Clovis stuff in other, other videos, that there were um, making tools out of the teeth, the tusks, and various pieces of bone. Um, this is kind of a cool specimen that that I promise will eventually end up in the Florida Museum of Natural History with the rest of this animal. But this are, these are a pair of um, weekly, now they've oxidized a little bit, they're unstained 34,000 year old mastodon foot bones from a mastodon that we found uh, and we excavated in 95. These eroded later and somebody collected them and gave them to me. Um, I haven't turned them over yet because we want to uh, drill them and try and do a few isotope things and potentially genetics too as well. We'd love to see um, well, any information we can about this lady. She was probably 17, 18 years old and was pregnant when she passed away. We found fetal mastodon bones mixed in with hers um, and also a lot of the gut content, so we found digesta. So a lot of those uh, plant remains that I spoke about in, the, in one of the early videos about um, mastodon stomach contents um, came from this individual. So there's, there's more to be done there. And um, In Florida, we had the Colombian mammoth, which looks more like my, my peanut can, maybe you can see it better in the bottom of the bowl, which is a, a ridiculous, but the, the, word, the use of the word mammoth to describe an elephant and peanuts is, as an adjective has been um, going on for a couple hundred years, and there's a, there's a story there that I'll tell when I, when I talk about mammoths and mastodons. Um, mammoth, the American mastodon, the mammoth is really um, woolly mammoths up north, and Colombian mammoths across the southern, imagine the I-10 corridor gets more of the Colombian mastodons. And mastodons are also here with gomphotheres in Florida, maybe in, in some of the other places sort of south of I-10, but um, a whole host, I've skipped probably 50 animals I should have mentioned, probably half a dozen extinct things, but um, I've already gone way longer than I intended. But the idea is that very vibrant, teeming with life Pleistocene that's a landscape shrinking fairly rapidly fast enough that plants and animal communities either have to move, adapt, or they're in many cases going to be inundated. Florida loses a hair over 50% of its land mass and North America loses probably 12-13% of the land mass. So if you imagine the ring constricts, it's enough that things are pushed in and we see animals become more archaeologically or paleontologically visible. And that's probably happening with archaeological sites as well. So um, probably need to go scuba diving out on that continental shelf some more. Why did I think of that? I think that's probably enough for now. Happy Halloween. Thank you so much for watching. Um, and thanks so much for all the new subscribers. And we'll have more videos soon. We're, we're, we're back in the habit, as it were. Thank you.